Well, first of all, I don't know if we want to go ahead and set up why we're in my office right now. And, and Do you think space. they care about that? I don't know. Maybe not. Okay, whatever. Yeah, we're in your office because that's where we're at. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> deal with it, internet. So, Brad, how did we end up in Anza Borrego for this trip? Well, pretty much with, with all of our trips, the way that we decide where we're going to go has to do with the weather. Yeah. In the wintertime, we're pretty much just trying to stay above freezing temperatures at night. And in the summertime, we're pretty much trying to stay below about 85 or 80 degrees during the day. Yeah, absolutely. Because I remember when we stayed in Anza Borrego, once it starts touching, you know, 85 or higher, then you really start feeling that heat and it's yeah. just miserable. Yeah, and for this trip, it's wintertime. So it was recorded uh, the weekend of like February 4th, 2023. And so we were concerned about cold. We want to make sure that it's not going to be below freezing temperatures at night. And part of that is because we're wusses and we don't want to be in freezing cold temperatures for very yeah. long. We're, we're, we're definitely spoiled by uh, living in the Southwest. But the main thing is just like when things freeze, it's annoying to deal with. Um, the water freezes and then you don't have anything to drink or cook with in the morning. And so, yeah, there's just a lot of reasons to not go below freezing. Elevation really screws with weather. Yeah, because we learned that in Coyote Flats. Yeah. <laughs> <when we're laughs> Yeah, yeah, it gets really, it was a 40 degree difference between the top of Coyote Flats and the bottom of Coyote Flats at roughly the same time. This time we went a little bit different route. We used ChatGPT. So we just specified that we were wanting to camp on a specific weekend in Southern California and we wanted it to be above 40 degrees at night and we wanted to do dispersed camping. Like we plugged in all these criterium into it and then we said, where's, what's, what parks should we be looking at? Chat GPT is, it's still so new that we just decided, you know, how do we find a campsite using that AI and if there's anything yeah. hidden, which we did find. And and yeah. that was one of those areas that we found using Chat GPT and it turned out great. Yeah, it was, it turned out good. Um, I would say that it didn't find our spot, but it pointed us in the direction we ended up going. So if you just want to find out like, where can I camp where it's not going to be freezing on a given weekend and in, I'm in a certain area of the country. It's pretty good at like pointing you in the right direction. From there, we used Gaia GPS, Google Earth, trailsoffroad.com, and those are the big three resources. And then we try to like locate multiple campsites before yeah. we go. So we have a plan A, a B, a C, and a D. Well, I was using Google Earth and Gaia to try to find campsites from space basically. And the one thing that I found out about this area of Anza Borrego is that, and I don't know if you noticed this while you were coming out, but there's all the big open areas that you can see from space that look like good campsites. They have signs up that say, don't go driving on it, don't go camping on it. A bunch of spots that I thought we could camp at, it turned out we weren't allowed to. Something to consider when you're using satellite imagery to try to find campsites is that you might not actually be able to get to those spots in certain parks. When we read the forecast for camping in Anza Borrego, and we've, we've done this a lot of times because what, we've camped there like five times now, something mm -hmm. like that, and each time there's always some relevant wind. The campsite that we did find, it was surrounded by mountains, so it looked like it blocked the, the gusts of yeah. wind that was coming through. Yeah. And sometimes in canyons too, the, the canyon can actually amplify the wind. And you can get a wind tunnel effect sort of happening. I think with this one, it blocked the wind. For us, it's just like cross your fingers <laughs> and hope that it's not gonna be too bad. Yeah. What was it like in your forerunner with the wind? The wind, I've never had an issue with it. I'm fine, I'm protected. It's, yeah. it's comfy in there. And that's why I prefer that over tenting. But you sleep in the rig and that ha comes with all the protections of the vehicle. Yeah. It seems like you wouldn't get as much noise. You wouldn't get as cold. Is it warmer in the vehicle or? The, the only thing that I did uh, that did bother me, like originally, was that I had an Amazon sleeping mat. It was very uncomfortable. So I have now the X-Ped and it fits into the back of my car. So. Yeah, the X-Ped Mega Mat. Awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. what I have, yeah. yeah. On this trip, and, and you've done this before, is you left a day earlier than I did yeah. and to claim a spot. Yeah, anytime we find a spot from the internet, you know that other people can find that spot from yeah, the internet. Yeah, super easy. It's super easy to find those spots. So, like I said earlier, we have a lot of resources that we're using that a lot of people use. They're great resources, but the unfortunate side consequence of that, there's gonna be a lot of people out there. In our case, 
We had four vehicles in total that were coming out and we had two big ground tents that were gonna sleep four people um, in total in those and then everyone else was sleeping in vehicles. The challenge of getting four vehicles in two big tents at a campsite is, is real. And the area that we're going to is incredibly popular. So in Anza Borrego, all of the, the northwest side, the east side, the south side, they're all well-known and well-traveled areas. So you're gonna see a lot of traffic. Um, we were pretty far out there, but on really well-known trails. So I left a day early. That way I could secure a big spot. Then you guys came out the next day. What was, what was it like on your side coming out? Before we headed out of our place, everybody wanted coffee, so we had to start of course. Starbucks. Yeah, and then everyone's gonna have to pee because of all the coffee. Yes, yeah. and so we drove about an hour and a half to Rancho Cucamonga already 45 minutes past when we were supposed to be there. Yeah. And as soon as we got to Rancho Cucamonga, we stopped at Bass Pro Shop to pick up supplies, but also just regroup with everybody else. Yeah. And that took even like half an hour to 45 minutes just because people need to use the bathroom, then people wanted to gas up, and then everything else in Plus between. you're like dicking around inside of Bass yeah, Pro everybody Shop. wanted to look at the guns. Guns. Lots of guns. Of course, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so cool. Yeah, and, and like Phil was trying on hats because he really wanted one, but he never bought one. Yeah, so. Phil is like our uh, friend that is always gear challenged. He shows up in like dress boots <laughs> and like a jean jacket. Yeah, he came out of the uh, our camping trip, but he looked like Judd Nelson from, <laughs> from the Breakfast Club. So that was pretty great. We wouldn't have had a great time should we have left on all on a Saturday. Yeah. You know? Because you did go out on Friday by yourself, how was that? Yeah, going solo camping is always a bit, you get a little bit nervous the first few times I think you do it, but after you get used to going out solo, it's, it's fine. You wanna make sure that you're on really easy trails and that you have materials that can get you out, maybe like traction boards or something like that for a place like Anza Borrego. The only real issues you're gonna run into on most Anza Borrego trails is deep sand. And if you happen to stop in the deep sand at some point, you could get yourself stuck. When you drive in the sand, it's kind of funny because your car just, it doesn't stay straight. It kind of glides along the surface. That's okay. It's no challenge for the forerunner. Careful right there. Big dip in the deep sand. Definitely pretty deep here. So the trail that we were on, right? So obviously there was some areas that you do need a little bit of height clearance. You can't take just the sedan out there. At least as far as we got, I saw some Priuses, of course. It made it as far as the ravine and it stopped right there. Okay. But then for the rest of the way, I would say that as long as you have off-road tires and a little bit of ground clearance, you should be fine for that entire trip. At one point, the trail is just soft dirt, very smooth. I think at a transition somewhere around where the oasis starts, things start to get a little bit hairier. They do put a big gatekeeper up, like a big bump that you have to hit that is meant to probably stop a lot of cars from continuing. For us though, it's 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 no big deal. Yeah. Um, but if you're in a, a car or a sedan or something like that, you, you're probably not gonna make it. Yeah, I would say if you have, you know, a Subaru, even like any sort of just basic CUV, you should be most likely okay, especially if it has tires on it and it's four wheel drive. It's gotta have tires to roll. Right. So. so. <laughs> This trail is different than the other ones that we've been in Anza Borrego. We usually go to Fish Creek, which is like sandstone canyon, sheer canyon walls. This one was wide open. There was a lot of water features that were out in the desert. So it was weird to see like oases and the snow melt coming from far away mountains, reaching all the way to this point in the desert via like streams and creeks and stuff like that. So it made for a really dynamic trail. Definitely has some areas with deep sand, but it was cool. There was elevation differences. We're going up and down hills. There was creek crossings. There was lots of stuff to see. There was lots of waypoints and things like that. So the trail starts at Coyote Canyon Road. Eventually that turns into dirt. 
And then there's a desert gardens area. This is where the, the trail is gonna start to get a little bit more rough. And you're gonna hit a junction. And then from there, we took a shortcut out, Sheep Canyon Road. That leads all the way out to Sheep Canyon Primitive Campgrounds. There are first come, first serve paid spots. But around there, there's also um, free spots that you can take first come, first serve as well. Be prepared for a lot of people. If you're gonna go out there, and definitely want to maybe send someone a day early or everyone to not go during, like you're probably not gonna get a spot if you show up on Saturday. And there's a reason why this time of year is really important. Maybe you wanna explain that if, for folks who don't know. During this time between February and May in Anza Borrego, there is this phenomenon called the super bloom. So the super bloom is a time of the year in that specific area where there's a ton of California wildflowers that just pop out. Many people from all over California and different states, they make a way to go over here for vacation so they can see it. It, it is really beautiful actually. Yeah. But the last time that happened to us, we spent about a good two to three hours just trying to get out of Anza Borrego just because of traffic alone. Yeah. Because it was ridiculous. Yeah. So yeah, this trip, there was a bloom starting. Yeah. And traffic was pretty high. So what we're going to end up talking about with this trip is the number of people that we saw. So I don't think you would be sitting on the trail alone for very long. You could easily flag down another rig and get them to pull you out at any point. So um, definitely a great spot to go solo. Yeah. I was a bit nervous the whole way down that we weren't going to find a big enough spot for everyone and that everything was gonna be taken. We had been talking about the super bloom was coming. As I was driving out along the trail, I saw so many vehicles. I mean, probably about 20 vehicles on the way out to the trail coming out. And this is Friday at noon. I'm like very nervous at this point that we're not gonna find uh, anything. All of the campground spots were taken except for one. And then just down the road after I paid for it, I like drove down just to check out a little bit more. And there was a giant campsite <laughs> <laughs> that you didn't need to pay for. Uh, but it would also acts as a parking lot for folks that are doing um, scenic things around the area. Yeah. So we ended up seeing a ton of traffic because of that. When we finally got to the campsite, the first thing I noticed was we had like just people coming out of bushes. Like it was <laughs> like a horror film. <laughs> like, you know, it's just like groups of like all of these hikers and stuff just coming out of the weeds and everything. Yeah, it's funny because like I got out there I didn't see anyone. This guy, he comes out of the boulders and, and he just walks up to camp and he's like, oh, hey, how's it going? <laughs> no later than he left, another couple of people came out and they stopped and they talked with me for a while and they're telling me about where they, were, they went. They left, another group of people came. <laughs> Here I am thinking I'm gonna have this solo night where it's silent and I don't have anything but my thoughts. And then at night, the fullest of full size pickups, like <laughs> the biggest pickup and the largest camper, like sitting on the bed of this thing, the truck like sways really, it's really like, yeah, really like super heavy. Ram 3500 or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> something huge. They pull up, it's dark out. They stop, three guys get out of the truck. They look over, but they don't say anything. And they just proceed to walk into the canyon. <laughs> and I, I was like, what is going on? What are these dudes doing? So like an hour, hour and a half passes and they're still out there. You can see their flashlights the whole way. And they come walking up and I'm like, oh, did you guys lose something out there? And they're like, nah. I'm like, okay, so what are you doing? <laughs> like, why are you hiking in the middle of the night? So they came back and you know, they start to get into the truck and I'm like, these guys are weird right like for sure so they back the truck up and they do like a 60 point turn because it's such a huge ass truck and they get they start going and i'm like thank god and they pull maybe 20 yards away and just stop <laughs> uh but i was like these guys are all mad like they, they have to be like what are you doing like <laughs> So what did we learn from this trip? The first thing that I learned is that this Northwest section of Anza Borrego has a ton to offer. I think that there are, there's lots of like little scenic trails and things to go do and lots of information posts to read. And there's a lot to do in that area. 
yeah, that was our first time there and definitely one of my favorites. I, I really do want to go back to that because there was so much hiking out there that you can easily spend two days out there and sure. not be bored. Yeah, definitely. For our first few years going out to Anza Brega, we've been going out there now for like four or five years. Yeah, it's a lot. For our first year or two, we focused on Fish Canyon because there was so much to explore on the south side. Yeah. And then just the last year, we started visiting some of the eastern parts of the park and then this time was the north side of the park. And I think one thing that just keeps getting solidified every time we go out there is Anza Borrego is huge. Yeah. There is a ton of stuff to see out there and you can spend years exploring it <laughs> and never seeing the same thing twice. That's really true. Yeah, because we've gone ahead too and like even Fonts Point, it took us a lot of effort just to go through there, but that was awesome too. Yeah. We had a great time. One thing that we learned on this trip is you either need to send a scout party that goes out and gets you, secures you a spot ahead of time, like during the week. Yeah. Or the whole crew just needs to go during the week and show up on a Thursday or something like that, or a Friday uh, morning um, and secure a spot because Anza Borrego is beautiful. It's worth the crowd, yeah. but there is going to be a crowd. That's my take as well is definitely go on a, a Friday, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to try to get out there and make the most out of it because Saturday, you know, we wouldn't have found anything at all. No. What, what would you give the trail rating itself? One to five, five, five being hard. hard. Yeah. Yeah. This is a one and a half, two. There's a couple points where you might have to keep your eyes on the road. And I would say like running into people is more dangerous than the trail itself. I would only say that there was one area I was potentially skeptical of was when we were going downhill. A little bit off-putting, but it, would, it turned out to be nothing. I think it was just all in my head. It was fine. Yeah, I would say that it's the washboard road part of it kind of sucked. Yeah. Um, I lost my roto packs off the back of the Jeep. No way. Well, my water tanks fell off at some point. Gonna need to go find them, I guess. I think where you're talking about is where it fell off. It was a flat road. <laughs> and so it's kind of silly, but like I lost my packs off the back of it. How long did it take you to get out there? It was about an hour. Yeah. Um, I had to turn around because I lost my roto packs. <laughs> Um, but that only cost me maybe five to 10 minutes or something like that. I, I, I figured it out before I got too far down the trail. Did you need four by four? I put it in four high, but I actually didn't even use it. So same, um, four I, high, but didn't need it probably. I didn't even air down this yeah. trip. You know? I did, I did for the washboards. 